Last night, a car was broken into at the home of Mrs. Strange. Thankfully, she noticed that whoever committed the crime left behind a sample of blood where they scraped themselves on the broken glass, and she has surveillance footage of all the people that came near the car that night. However, the actual car was just out of range of the video, so it was not able to catch the act. This is why she has called us the best trained in DNA fingerprinting by using PCR analysis. Let's grab a sample of the blood and take it to the lab for testing. Here we have our subjects, the mailman, the victim's boyfriend, neighbor number one, and neighbor number two. We have gotten a DNA sample from each of them for the investigation along with a sample from the car owner so we know we are not accidentally testing her DNA. To get what is known as a DNA fingerprint, we run a polymerase chain reaction on the samples to separate the fragments of DNA into specific alleles. We will be analyzing these alleles at two separate loci in the human genome as sometimes two people can have the same result at one loci but using a second will provide us with a definitive match. Alleles are shown to vary by using electrophoresis to separate the fragments based on the distance they travel in the gel medium. DNA fragments can be different sizes unique to a person because there are a variable number of copies of the short repeated sequences which we call the variable number of tandem repeats. The gel separates the fragment size using a positive charge to pull the fragments towards one end and watching them separate. The concept on how separation occurs can be demonstrated by dropping something with a large surface area into a container of water and something with a small surface area into the same container. The small object will travel to the bottom of the glass while the large object will remain towards the top. This is the same way we see fragments with fewer repeats as small and they migrate further through the gel than the larger fragments with more repeats. The sizes of the fragments are measured by the number of base pairs long that unit is. Here are our results from the tests. We tested the alleles from each subject, the car owner and the evidence at locus A and locus B on separate gels. The fragments were labeled with their respective lengths and base pairs. Beginning with locus A, we see the evidence has two fragments, one that is 30 base pairs and one that is 10 base pairs long. Now we look at our suspects to see who can match at this locus. Anyone that does not can be excluded as the criminal. The car owner has two fragments that are 40 and 5 base pairs, which are much farther apart than the evidence, so she cannot be the person who left the evidence. The same can be said for both of the neighbors. We find that two people match, the mailman and the boyfriend. Now to locus B. We run through the same process, but we will only have to look at those two suspects to find the match because the alleles have to match at all loci tested for it to be considered from the same person. At locus B, we see that the mailman and neighbor number two match the evidence at 40 base pairs and 20 base pair lengths. The mailman matched the evidence at both loci, and therefore he is the one that broke into the car that night. Aside from the crime, we notice something else that the data hints to, which is that neighbor number one, the woman, is most likely the mother of neighbor number two, the 20-year-old male. How we came to this conclusion is that at each of the loci tested, the two of them had one common fragment. This can indicate paternity because one allele from each parent is passed on to their child, therefore each parent will share one similar fragment to their child when a DNA fingerprint is made. Now you see how we use the DNA fingerprinting to help correctly identify criminals and also conduct paternity tests.